episode of The Writing Show in Sparkler, South Carolina. It's January the 16th, 2014, and our panel is here to talk to us about traditional publishing versus self-publishing. Um, many of you have their bios, but quickly. This is Karen Siegfried from Charlotte. She is um, an editorial consultant. Uh, she has worked for major publishers in New York, as well as Baker and Taylor and Ingram book distributors. Betsy Thorpe is next door to her, and Betsy has also worked in New York with Random House and other organizations, and she's an ed editor and advisor in the publishing business. Both of them are, are here from Charlotte tonight. Uh, beside her, we have Susan Boyer, who is a uh, USA Today best-selling uh, mystery writer, uh, a new series called Low Country Boil or Low Country Bombshell, and she's working on a couple of others. Um, Susan is here because she um, has gotten a contract with a small press, and she will talk to us about that. And Pam Stone, many of you all know her. She's been on television, and she's in the newspaper every, uh, every Sunday. And Pam is an actress and a comedian and a very successful self-publishing author. So I wanted her here to tell you about her experience. Now, um, I, I thought the way we would get it started is to give you a little context about the publishing business. Uh, Karen knows a little bit about this, and Karen, will you tell us about the numbers of books that are published and what the various ways that you can publish a book? Um, well, I hear a lot that people are concerned that they can't get a deal with a traditional publisher because there are so few deals out there. There are 180,000 new books published through traditional publishers every year. So <laughs> that, that theory is, is a myth that does not true. Um, traditional publishing, there's the big, now the big five publishers um, in New York, which you've, all, you've heard of. There's the Penguin Random House conglomerate. Uh, there's Macmillan, Hachette, HarperCollins, and Simon & Schuster. And then there's another big clump of mid-sized publishers, which are, again, mostly in New York. But then there are small presses all around the country, including Pop City Press. Um, and they, they do all sorts of, of books. For the larger and mid-sized books, uh, publishers, you do tend to need a literary agent. That is not the case with most small publishing presses. Um, and then, of course, there is self-publishing if these options don't suit you or your book. Okay. Um, so the word out there is that it is possible to be published by a major publisher. Um, how about the growth in self-publishing, Betsy? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Wow. Um, and pull it up because I think it projects better. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's been a huge growth in self-publishing, especially in the last eight to ten years um, with the advent of um, print-on-demand um, and e-readers. So if you all know what print-on-demand is, you can basically upload a book and have it printed 24 hours later and shipped. So there are a lot of companies that will do this for you. So the um, prospect of having a book that's slowly being gotten to the printing press and whatnot is, is um, it's kind of out the window with digital printing now. And then there are e-readers, Kindles, iPads, so forth, um, that you can instantly upload a book to your reader. And um, a lot of people who are finding success with e-books are um, romance publishers, um, mysteries, um, things that are have a voracious readership, um, like romance readers who often will read five books a week. So there's a huge need for more and more and more. So the faster you can write them, the faster they'll be. Um, one of the reasons I wanted Susan Boyer on this panel is um, she's writing a series of books, which is sort of uh, we're seeing more of that. You know, if you can write something that hooks people um, and have multiple stories in there. Oh, Susan, will you tell us a little bit about your experience? Um, I'm interested to know uh, 
when you knew your book was finished, and then how you went about actually finding a publisher, because this seems really daunting to people. I still don't think the first one's finished. <laughs> I would probably have kept writing it forever and ever and ever. <laughs> I don't think there really comes a point when you know that it's ready because you always, or at least I can only speak to what's true for me. I think I would always, I'm sort of a perfectionist, and I would always think, okay, I can go through it one more time. I can do a little more editing. I can make it a little better. So for me, it was sort of a process that dovetailed. I was looking for an agent and, you know, looking for an agent and looking for an agent. And, and so I was working on my manuscript, and it came to the point that I had an agent, and she said to me, yeah, Beverly, this is fine. We're going to submit this. And so at that point, I decided I was done. So I needed, I think, someone else to tell me I was done. Um, and then, of course, you know, when an editor gets a hold of it, that will tell you that it is, in fact, not done. And you will work on it some more. Um, and I think it becomes, past a certain point, it's in someone else's hands to tell you when it's done. It's done when someone is willing to publish it for you. Um, and then they want the next book in the series, and they're willing to publish that, and you know, then the whole thing starts again. But fortunately, you get to cut to the editor point at that point. Um, Pam, you told us an interesting story that involved Jay Leno at dinner, which I, I thought was terrific. Not the one about the dog, right? No, not the one about the dog. Use the microphone and, and tell us what Jay Leno told you about an agent. <laughs> I guess when he started, when you know, moving as a little neophyte comedian to Los Angeles from Marietta, Georgia, in 1985, and I just lucked out because there was hardly any chick comics in the 80s, so I was working a lot. And um, working with Jay was my second road gig ever, and I worked with him for three weeks on the road. And I said to him, probably exactly what everybody says. Uh, whenever they're trying to get an agent, whether it be a lit agent or a theatrical agent or a manager for booking stand-up comedy, well, everybody says you have to have experience to get an agent, but the agents don't want you unless you have experience, and you can't get experience unless you get the agent, so how do you do it? And Jay said, let me tell you something, because you can't do Jay unless you do Jay. You know, I can't tell you anything unless I try to do a poor impression of Jay. You will get an agent when somebody looks at you on stage and thinks they can make money off you. Right? <laughs> So no matter how good you think your book is, or how good you think you are as a stand-up comic, or as an undiscovered actor, or whatever, no one's going to take a chance on you unless they look at you as something so marketable they're going to make a living off their percentage of you. Yeah, very good. Um, and on that same subject, what are publishers looking for these days? Um, you know, I'm sure we have all kinds of writers out here. Um, what are they looking for? Well, uh, one of my good friends is a um, children's book agent. She does a lot of um, big YA books. And apparently dystopian uh, books like Hunger Games, uh, Divergent, are out. Uh, nobody wants those anymore. They want real, um, real fiction about real life people who are living in the present day. Um, so that's interesting. Um, one thing that I always um, tell people about is sometimes you know you can you can identify a you know type of fiction that you're looking for. I want something set in the South in 1860, but that's never going to come across your desk. What you want is what you don't know that you want that comes across as so fresh and exhilarating, and the voice is new. I mean, when I read um, the Bernadette, what was that called? Where'd you go? Where'd you go, Bernadette? Completely amazing voice on that original. I'm sure we all felt the same thing about Gone Girl. Um, you know, those are the books that when it comes to, into a publishing house, we all just set everything down and say, this is gold, this is amazing, we're going to publish this. Um, so oftentimes you can't identify any one thing because it's going to be completely new and fresh. Obviously people capitalize on, you know, things that are happening like <coughs> games, but Good fiction is good fiction. Yeah, that new and fresh is really what we're talking about here, Karen. Um, how does a writer know if they've written something new and fresh? <laughs> um, I'd say don't chase the trends and write what you want to write and write what inspires you. Don't, don't try to write another vampire book. The process of publishing takes so long, I mean, years pretty much minimum. 
that by the time, if you are trying to chase a trend, it's dead by the time your book comes out. So the, the way that other vampire books actually came out in the few months after Twilight is those were books that were already in the pipeline. Other people who had had this idea independently, who were writing vampire books, even though vampire books were not a thing at that time, then it got hot, and so manuscripts that were already in submission suddenly got bought. But you can't start writing a vampire book when you read Twilight, and is that that'll be three years minimum. So just write what you love. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Betsy was also wanting to know about, um, you know, how do you know if it's good? Um, and we always, always, always encourage getting, um, having a, a writer's group, um, if you can, passing around, having what we call beta readers, um, and then possibly consulting, you know, an editor, um, an independent editor to, you know, run it by and say, hey, I think I've got something good here, but I'm not entirely sure. Is it worth me, you know, trying for six months to get an agent, or should I just go straight to self-publishing? Um, <coughs> And we always, I mean, your, your best work can still be polished over and over again with outside um, feedback. So I encourage everybody to get that because you can't see, you may think that you've written something connecting A to B to C to D, but you probably um, you know, have left something out. So it's good, to, it's good to get many readers. And it's embarrassing and people are shy about their writing. And I'm shy about rhyme writing. I completely understand that, but this is not necessarily a, a business. A, it's a business of shy people writing for a public. So you know, keep that in mind. That you, you at one point you have to you have to let it go. You have to you know send it to somebody else. Susan, tell us um, when you sent your book to the publisher. Tell first of all, talk about who your publisher is. What happened to it once it got that far? My publisher is Henry Press, and they're out of Plano, Texas, and they're a relatively new small publisher. Um, I ended up with them through a series of fortunate for me events that at the time I thought were unfortunate. My agent got sick and went out on leave and never came back. And um, eventually, I ended up going with the small press, and I knew someone who was starting a press. And I said to her, you know, um, I've been on submission with this agent that I've been assigned to for a while. He's a great guy. He's doing his best. But his editorial contacts, and this is the agent they assigned me to after my agent went on um, sick leave. And he was a great guy, and he tried really hard, but his editorial contacts just weren't um, the right ones for my book. So, I knew someone who was starting a small press, and she and I knew each other through Sisters in Crime, and uh, I sent it to her, and I said, what do you think? And she said, should I call your agent, because I'd like to offer you a contract, and I'm like, yeah, give him a call. Well, you know, they didn't really want to be involved with small presses, They and so he said, basically, we will exclude this book from your agency agreement, and you know, we'll work with the next book, and you just, you know, I'll look over the contract, make sure you're protected, and then, you know, all that. And Super, super nice guy, but eventually um, we parted ways amicably and I went with the small press and, and decided that that's where I wanted to be because it's such a good fit for me and I think that's important, finding what's a good fit for you. And what's so exciting about now for authors is that, they, is that we have so many options. Um, New York is still publishing 180,000 books a year and, and I didn't know that number, but I know it was a lot. And um, Small publishers are, are popping up, and, and some of them are great, but you have to do your homework. Um, and self-publishing is a great option for some people. Um, if you didn't open for Leno, you know, your odds are probably not as great, but you know, a lot of people are doing it successfully. But I'm sorry, I'm digressing. What happened to my book was uh, we went through a traditional editorial process. I submitted it, she bought it, we went through the editorial process, and um, we went back and forth, we did, you know, all the way through proofreading, and then um, they started creating ARCs, and suddenly they were sending it to reviewers, and um, then it was up for sale online, and then it was, you know, they were shipping to bookstores, and it was just like any other book that's published, and it was wonderful and exciting, and um, that's, that's it.
said, and you used a term that I, I think a lot of ears picked up on, uh, bought. Someone bought <laughs> your work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the money in this business. Um, what writers can expect, should expect, um, and we're going to start with Pam, who self-published. Um, I want you to tell us why you self-published and how that's worked out for you. You know, what are the costs uh, and how that's worked out for you uh, as, the, as the publisher and the writer. Sure. Um, I, I used to think of self-publishing as, well, that's for people who really aren't good enough to get an agent. God bless them. And that's sweet. Because, you know, really, if they had any value as writers, they would be, what? Yeah. yeah. And then I had a radio show for 10 years up Charlotte, and uh, a talk radio show, and, and one of the guests I interviewed was the author of The Shack. And he told us that he originally wrote that book just as a private gift for his kids, <clears throat> and his family to explain and try to describe his personal relationship with God. That's all. It was a very private kind of religious epiphany for him. Under no circumstances was it meant to be. It was just this gift. And of course, members of the family loved it and lent it to somebody. And the next thing you knew, he sold 7 million copies worldwide and he self-published and didn't have to pay a dime of royalties to anyone. And I said, so let me look at this self-publishing. <laughs> and, and it's what I did. Now, now Bets, Betsy made a really good point. Um, for me, it was a little bit easier because if, if you self-publish, it depends on what your um, definition of success is. Is it just because you always want to get a book in print and you just want to say, I did this, this is something I wanted my whole life and I've done it, or do you want to try to make a living? Because if you don't have certain things set up, it's going to wither on the vine and die. And it doesn't matter, you know, you can do a bunch of radio shows and get interviews. When was the last time you bought anything off of listening to something on the radio? You know, has it been a while? You know, besides Sham Wow or something, I mean, you know, as far as buying a book or something, generally if it's an author you know already, you're like, oh, great, I'm glad they have something new because I love it. Um, I published through Amazon Creative Space. It cost about a grand. Uh, my husband uploaded it because I'm an idiot. And what I did, I had a, like a little built-in um, following because I write in a regionally syndicated humor column that's in like eight or nine papers north of South Carolina. So what I did, this is a collection of those columns. I knew I already had a built-in fan base for that, okay, from judging from feedback I got on email and stuff. I also had a small built-in fan base from doing a sitcom for seven years and doing a radio show. So I knew I was what I was putting out was something people tend, have a tendency to ask me, is, when are you going to put those columns in a book? And I was like, all right, I'll put the columns in a book. And I got my niece to knock out the cover for me, paid her 200 bucks, she's a computer nerd. So now I'm into it for 1200 bucks. We uploaded it and um, I've sold hard copy, not even talking about digital, somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 copies and I don't even know, to tell you the truth, uh, digital. Not, not as many, probably 500 or something like that. So that's not bad for like a $15 is what it sells for. And a great way that you can market um, uh, this is something that I've done besides the fact that local bookstores, of course, want you to come and do readings. And I do a lot of stand-up for corporate events anyway. And they say, bring your books. And then another thing you can do, which I always do, because I do an awful lot of benefits and a lot of, I, I get a lot of requests to do Sertoma clubs and Rotary and Altrusa. Please bring your books. And then what I do is I always just um, give them back five bucks a book. You know, so their members, that encourages the members, because they know it's going right back to the organization. You can write it off. You're still going to make a tiny profit. I mean, this book for me it costs a little under three bucks a copy, okay? And I sell it for fifteen. So if I go and do a charity event, and I say I'm going to give you back ten, fifteen bucks, you get five. I keep ten. That's still a nice profit. It's better to make, if we're going to talk business, better to make a quick nickel, you know, than a slow dime. <laughs> okay. And um, your point also being that because you had an audience. Um, to begin with, that uh, 
enabled you to sell 2,500 books. It's, sometimes it's not that easy when you don't have an audience. No, you just have to get you have to get really creative. But even if you don't have an audience, if you don't have a column, if you don't, if you don't, I can push action. <laughs> I've done stand up. But if you don't have, uh, if you don't have, if you haven't been able to sit comedy, if you don't do stand up comedy, you still can offer yourself. To how many charitable organizations are there in Spartanburg? There's a million of them, and you're doing a good thing. You go to all these, you think of all the different, from animals to, to domestic abuse shelters, to everything, and say, I'd like to come in, I'd like to do a reading, these are stories or a book that I've written, I'd like to talk a little bit, and I'm going to time right back to you guys. That's a good thing to do. It's just a good thing to do, and it always ends up where you end up being blessed. So that the All right. Let's, um, uh, for the two, uh, these guys go by two editors and a comma in Charlotte. They do writer's workshops. I want y'all to talk a little bit about the financial side of the publishing, uh, traditional publishing business, um, and also a little bit about how to uh, avoid the scams that are out there that are trying to reel writers in uh, to self-publish. Um, so that's two questions there. What do you, you guys want to handle I'll, that? I'll do traditional if you want to do so. Um, so traditional, um, you get an advance upon future earnings on your royalties. Um, so the advance is based on um, what the publisher thinks that your royalties won't earn for the ter first two years of sale. Um, so the, the royalty has an escalator. So for a trade paperback, it would start at 7.5%. For a hardcover, the top is 15%. So if you think of a $10 book, you're earning 15% of that, that's about 50. Um, so if you think you're going to sell 5,000 copies of that book times a buck 50, that's how much that they might pay you. Um, so there's, it's, it's basically, you know, you're, you're playing um, a guessing game. Um, people think that, you know, people have spent years in publishing. There's big there's big corporate buildings that they're all, we're sitting around important boardrooms. Um, it's a guessing game. We have no idea how many books are going to be sold. Um, you know, it could be 2,000 is a great number. It's a great number for a major publishing house. Um, and it could be, you know, 100,000. So it's all based on, you know, a guessing game. Um, you, your agent is going to take 15% of anything that you receive. Um, you might try and sell other rights besides just the um, paperback rights, the ebook rights. Um, there are foreign sales, you can make a lot of money um, on foreign markets, um, audiobooks, um, serial rights with um, pieces being published in newspapers and magazines. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty much it. All right, we'll let Karen t uh, talk a little bit about. Um, some pitfalls to avoid uh, if you are self-publishing or, or if you are publishing with a with a publisher. There's a website called Predators and Editors. That is very important if you look at it. Um, there are definitely some scams out there. While a lot of them do target the self-publishing side of things, they do also target traditional publishing. You should never, ever pay an agent to read your manuscript. Never. There's also a group called the AAP, AAR. AAR, um, I think it's the Association of America Author Representatives. And most agents should belong to that, an exception being kind of brand new agents. But they have um, a list of ethics that all of their members subscribe to. Uh, I had a client a year or so ago who said that she had an agent interested. This agent, for me, had a lot of red flags. She had no website. I Googled her and she had no sales that I could find. She uh, did do extensive editing, but she also, she wanted the author to change her entire book from nonfiction to fiction, which is massive change. And then uh, she asked for it was a 50% royalty rate. Oh my goodness. Which should have made my client run screaming. <laughs> uh, she did 
talk to me. She had already on her own talked this agent down to 30%. And she also had a, a friend who's a lawyer involved in this conversation at this point. And she did get this woman, this agent, to <coughs> agree that she would, you know, if, if it was absolutely 100% necessary, she would agree to reducing it to 15%. And I told my client, take it, take it and run, or just run, either way. <laughs> but asking for 30% is unethical. That's just wrong. This is not the agent's work. They have not put their lifeblood and their hours and days and years into this. The author has that they should be getting the bulk of the income. Um, you also want to research any small presses to make sure, again, that they aren't falling in this gray area. It's very easy for someone these days to just pop up and say, I'm a publisher. And I had a completely different client who did find a, a publisher online who, again, who wanted her to pay money in. And that should never happen. Some, a lot of small publishers don't do advances. They just don't have the funding. It's more, a lot of them are nonprofits. Some are even co-ops. But they should never have the author paying money in. You need to ask about their track record. What have they sold? Who have they sold it to? Look them up. Don't just take their word for it. You know, even if they have you know, some testimonials on their website, Google this publisher, find out who else they've published who isn't on their website. There are a lot of forums <coughs> out there of different authors talking about where they've submitted, who they've submitted to, and what their experience was. And it's really well worth the research. Um, on the self-publishing side of things, it's gotten cleaner, actually. It's gotten better. <laughs> there used to be um, vanity presses where you would have to spend $10,000 and end up with 200 cases of books sitting in your garage, oh, no. probably until the end of time. <laughs> um, and you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, Betsy mentioned print on demand, which is great, because you can really print. You can, you can get one case, you can get one book. Perfect example. Um, so, that's, it's kind of odd that it's shifted this way, but self-publishing has gotten better. There are some really big name companies out there, um, Lulu, Book Baby, Constellation, um, <coughs> Lightning Source, Lightning Source, Lightning Source Space. Space. Um, I'm blanking on one of the big ones. But if you're unsure, go with one of the big ones. <coughs> you know that they've got a good track record and they know what they're doing. Well, we are rolling now, and a lot of good information is coming out. Um